global warming, the rest of the story. And that's what we're giving you. It's the rest of the story. We're here with two scientists. We've got physicists. Uh, Gordon Folks and meteorologist Chuck Weiss, and we'd love to hear you. Uh, your questions. This is a live show tonight on on April 26th between 8:30 and 9:30, live with Lisa Michaels. Yes, I am running for Congress in the first congressional <laughs> district. I would like to unseat David Wu's lawyer's wife, who um, got the won the uh, the honor of serving for a few months in Congress uh, to represent us, and I'd like to remedy the fact that we just sent one of David Wu's biggest supporters, one of the people that kept him in office for all that time, and I, you can't tell me that they didn't know he had some serious issues, and we rewarded them by electing his lawyer's wife. So pretty scary, but you know what? We can remedy that. You can vote for Lisa Michaels. And uh, the, the, the shamelessly promoting my campaign here on public access. It is public access. Anybody can do it. My opponent can can come in here and do a show and uh, you know it's free uh, speech at this point I don't know how much longer it'll last with li liberty limiting things like global warming telling us you can and cannot do everything and they justify everything they justify the light rail they justify your car they justify these different cocktails of gasoline they justify Something important though to mention here since you mentioned the politics let me mention that uh, even though we have political ideas also uh, science is profoundly non-political. It should be, but if that's not the case with this, I don't Well, think. no, it, it, it isn't. Wrong. On the other hand, science is basically non-political. Uh, if, if we had a wider panel in this room and we had Claude Allegre, who's a, a socialist uh, minister of education in the French, uh, previous French socialist government, I would be sitting with him because even though he's a socialist, he's got the right idea on global warming. What about Ivar Gaever, who's a Nobel laureate in physics, an old man now, uh, who supported Obama in 2008 uh, uh, and is very definitely a Democrat, but he's right on global warming. He quit the American Physical Society saying that uh, a temperature increase of eight-tenths of a degree centigrade uh, over the 20th century is remarkable stability rather than remarkable instability. And many other scientists, uh, Martin Hertzberg, who makes a big point of the fact that he is a Democrat, a liberal Democrat, he's also on my side. So I would be sitting with them in this room, not necessarily with you, not Lisa. Not necessarily uh, with me. On, on the basis of politics, no. No, 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 no. It shouldn't be. No, That's it shouldn't. what's so it wonderful about this. Uh, you you can come from a liberal background and all sorts of different well, issues, I essentially do. and you do. Um, I mean, I University, come from University of Chicago. Chicago. I mean, my goodness. Um, and and but but we should all unite around the idea that we should have actual honesty and integrity in the science. You should support the best science. That's you have right. to support the best science. And, and what, How do we what determine what the best that? science? Logic and evidence. There aren't any other things involved in, in science. It's not whether I have a good education and therefore am more right than Phil Moat at Oregon State University, who also has a good education. It's only the logic and evidence that we can bring to bear on this. So there will be people, if people call in, they will say, well, what about the National Academy of Sciences? They support Phil Moat's perspective, not our perspective. Very true. But who, who pays the bills for the National Academy of Sciences? What is it supposed to do? Well, it was set up, I think, during the Abraham Lincoln era, and it was supposed to uh, uh, deal with these sorts of problems. But in fact, it has simply become another government agency that supports the government's political programs. And, and that is absolutely wrong. And this absolutely idea wrong. of consensus is absolutely foolish, too, because it doesn't matter how many people subscribe to uh, believing whether CO2 can change the climate. It's whether it actually is and what evidence do you have to show that it's done that. And none of these people who prescribe to the use of these climate models, which are proven failures, have done the correct calculations. I don't know why they won't do them. It's, it, well, for one thing, it's difficult to do that. In order to be able to see all the heat energy in terms of radiation that's leaving the Earth, that's a very complicated problem because it's, it's global in nature. The satellites don't look at the Earth uh, at the same instant in time all over the entire Earth. But that's, in essence, what you have to do to be able to figure out what effect any of the increase in greenhouse gases is actually having on the Earth's temperature. You can't just take a concentration and a theoretical forcing and say this is 
is what the temperature will respond to when you don't have the answer to the rest of the problem. And it's completely disingenuous and dishonest to claim that you do and that it's been loaded into modeling and then uh, the modeling, of course, is expected to give you this preconceived or accurate answer about what's going to happen with the temperature is. And the fact of the matter is, if you verify the modeling, you see that it's completely failed. Well, that's George Taylor. He's the former uh, uh, Oregon State climatologist who was uh, 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 sacked by Governor Kulingowski or forced out by Governor Kulingowski. The, the genesis of this is, the reason I brought this up, is because this is a one-of-a-kind event where we had three well-known, well-educated, well-versed on this subject scientists talking about how this is really a fraud. And yet, and this was an AMS, AMA, a, 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 wait, okay. AMA. American Meteorological Society's Oregon chapter, the largest American Meteorological Society chapter in the United States that is not connected directly with the university. Trying this for quite a while, and they have only had alarmist presentations up until our presentation. We tried to schedule one. Yeah. We had one all scheduled at uh, uh, OMSI, Oregon OMSI, Museum yes. of Science and Industry. And Phil Mote from Oregon State University and Christina Holba oh, from uh, Portland State uh, mm -hmm. called in and said, uh, uh, don't let it happen sort of thing. Yeah, they basically they snubbed us. The, the, the presenters at Portland State, uh, which were Phil and uh, Christina Holby, were actively involved in telling OMSI not to even allow us to present. We didn't well, meet their that. standards. Is what well, yeah, we didn't meet their standards. It means they didn't believe in the fraud. Yeah. So, you That's know right. what, let's see what Mike has to say. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I'm here. There, oh, we can hear you, Mike. Okay, um, great. Go, go ahead. Um, do you have a question for one of the scientists? Well, or it was more just an um, observation. I had a run-in with the old editor at the Oregonian who has recently passed away, and he told me they would run what they wanted to run as far as global warming. And I was wondering, since he has passed away, is there any chance of getting the Oregonian back on the side of sensibility versus this hysteria? Or hysteria? Um, oh, okay. Mike, you're probably addressing that to me because I've written a number of op-eds for the Oregonian, and the only reason I got those op-eds in was because of Bob Caldwell. Uh, 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 his passing uh, it makes it more difficult, not less difficult, to get things in the Oregonian. I think they have reverted back to being uh, entirely one-sided at this point. I will continue to try, but uh, they haven't been happy with what I've been writing. And so you know what we did? If you want to, go into the voter's guide. I'm getting political again. <laughs> if you go into the voter's guide and you look for CD1 and Lisa Michaels and you want to see my voter's guide answers for the Oregonian, there's a question about global warming. And I started to rant and rave about how I wanted to answer it. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to seek some uh, professional advice with this answer. And I'm pleased to tell you that some of your words, I won't say which, um, a lot of them, uh, did make it into the Oregonian, even though they wouldn't allow Gordon to, Dr. Folks, to be writing in there. You can see some of his, his ideas in my answer to the global warming, Lisa Michaels for CD1. And There's you can compare them with the Democratic candidate for the same seat and uh, yes. see, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. see that she is entirely into the hysteria and nothing else. Uh, she, of course, went after uh, uh, Rob Cornelis previously on this. Cornelis was kind of ducking the issue, which I think was unfortunate. Uh, we then uh, bucked him up a bit with some information that was easy to understand that he could present, and the next time that Bonamisi presented that material, uh, I, uh, she had considerable trouble from Cornelis. This time, we're getting Lisa that's up right, to speed that's right away. Right. That's right. That's right. So, get, you know, check it out. That's Lisa Michaels, CD1. Go in there. <laughs> voter's Guide. You have to kind of go through. I think it's like on the ninth page. I, it got me behind the mayors and all. The climate uh, alarmists who engage in this hysteria they like to separate anybody that doesn't agree with their position out as something uh, or somebody unqualified to speak about climate. Now with me, they'll say, well, who are you? You're just a meteorologist. You forecast the weather. You don't know anything about climate. Well, climate is, is an integration of weather. That's absolute nonsense. What we study in our training academically goes directly to climate because it borrows exclusively, almost exclusively, from atmospheric science, and atmospheric science is derived from physics. And so the same sort of nonsense applies to Dr. Folks when they say, well, you're not qualified to talk about climate, Dr. Folks. You've never published any work in it, and you're just a astrophysicist. Well, that's exactly what James Hansen is. But to these uh, fear-mongering climate hysterics, uh, he is their hero, and he is more than qualified to talk, but yet they have the same background. So it just goes to show you these arguments that you hear are strictly political. They're absolute nonsense. They make no sense. So when you hear a meteorologist or a physicist talk about climate, 
you should listen to what they have to say because they know enough about it to, uh, to where they're perfectly qualified to talk about it and to give opinions. Like science, and I just I realize that there's just no way that what they were saying, you know, we're bigger. I mean, the Earth is so much bigger than us, and for us to I think that we can, you know, figure out what it's doing in in the short amount of time that we've had that we've observed things, it's just ridiculous. And like I said, I went and saw George Taylor uh, do a presentation, and he sold me. Ridiculous! It's just a crying what shame. What is it? What is a climatologist, a state climatologist's job actually to do? Basically, basically to document and to uh, record the climate history of the state of Oregon. That was basically his job, and it was on both sides of the Cascades. But George did so much more than that, and this is why he was such a gem and such a loss, I think, to the university to, to have him pushed out politically like he was, because he not only did that, he did very legitimate climate research, and guess what? He was the only guy, the only guy, do you hear that, Phil? down at Oregon State, the camera uh, you know, do you, do you hear that? Uh, because he was the only guy uh, at the time back in the 90s who had looked into the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and, and made a number of inferences from them and concluded that the climate wasn't going to continue to warm. Now this is at the same time we had the climate code coming out from all these climate models telling us the temperatures were going to continue to go up. Guess what? George is no longer there, but his work without a computer climate model, just that he did in uh, studying how the PDO and the, uh, the El Nino-La Nina effects uh, dominate Oregon's climate like they were, he made a correct inference about what was going to happen in the future. He's the only guy back in that time who did. And the rest of these guys who pushed him out their forecasts were completely wrong. It was wrong. Governor Kulongoski that uh -huh. that uh, that got all upset over the. They they made a, a they had a climate debate with Phil Mode and him back in 2007. That was that was hosted by the Oregon AMS. It was uh, it occurred at OMSI, and the media gave this a lot of attention. But the media beat up on George and put words in his mouth, did all kinds of things, really treated him unfairly, and this got Governor Kulongoski all upset. And they just said, you know what, George has got to go. He doesn't conform to what the consensus opinion on climate is. Let's get rid I want to get to the crux of the matter. How do you guys have any idea how much money uh, is made from in this state or how many companies in this state rely on the fraud of global warming, rely on this hoax to, for their livelihood? Do you, have you ever looked I, at I that? I don't know, but it, it's, it's, it's a I fact. Because I think there's a lot. It's a fact that nationally there's a lot of them because the, the solar companies rely on this. Everybody basically who who's, is in the business of selling renewables is, is in the business of wanting to have climate hysteria back them up because the government subsidizes these things under the false pretense that we're damaging the climate and the environment with CO2 emissions and therefore renewables are the answer to our energy problems when they're not, but that's how it's sold. And so uh, they get subsidized by the government, uh, along with like wind, wind uh, energy and solar. They both get subsidized. In fact, we uh, just learned recently that Bonneville Power has to pay the, uh, for the unused power from these windmills now that uh, aren't turning as they were supposed to turn, or if they are turning, the uh, hydro, I guess, is so, uh, so efficient now with the cold phase of the PDO. Our snowpack is way up. There's more than enough power at the dam now to where they don't need the wind power. And so the guys who are being subsidized are crying and saying, well, that's not fair. Uh, we made an investment here, and we want to sell our power, and now we can't. So BPA said, well, get, we'll just buy it from you. Well, guess, guess what that means? That means eventually you and I have to pay the bill for that. And so we're paying the entire bill for those uh, in the end because they produce no net energy over uh, what went into their, uh, their production. Both solar and wind are a net zero sort of uh, thing where with any other of the conventional means of power, we get a lot of net energy out. That's why we have a society that, that runs efficiently. Uh, the one bright spot in all of this that uh, the Obama administration has been unable to uh, stamp down has been the, the, the great uh, discoveries in shale gas.